Good evening. I am Joanne Delaneva, the Academic Director of the London Global Gateway and Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures at the University of Notre Dame. On behalf of everyone at Notre Dame's London Global Gateway and Notre Dame International, I'm delighted to welcome you to our seventh annual London Shakespeare Lecture in honor of Sir Stanley Wells, which has been organized in collaboration with the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and the Shakespeare Institute. We at Notre Dame are eager to forge and to foster partnerships with premier intellectual and cultural institutions across the UK. And this event, which is undoubtedly one of the highlights of our academic year, is the fruit of just that sort of relationship for which we are very grateful. Before we begin tonight's lecture, I should like to thank all those who worked hard to make this event possible, especially our London events and communications team, as well as Boyka Skolova, who has worked tirelessly on this project. So now let me turn this over to Boyka, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Welcome to the seventh Notre Dame Shakespeare Lecture in honor of Professor Sir Stanley Wells. Uh, for the first time, unfortunately, tonight Stanley is not with us. He has a cold, uh, so he regrets he can't be here. Uh, but it's the um, reasonable decision not to come all the way from Stratford uh, to the lecture. Uh, I'm sure we all wish him well. Uh, our speaker tonight is Professor Michael Dobson, director of the Shakespeare Institute of the University of Birmingham. To start talking about Michael as director of the Institute is to start the story back to front. <coughs> It all, of course, began at the theater, where as a young schoolboy, he saw Terry Hans, Henry V. Many more years and theater performances later, and with the medi uh, mediation of teachers and an Oxford degree, this originary moment blossomed into a fully fledged career. No small part in Michael's development was played by Stanley Wells himself, who supervised his doctoral thesis on the growth of Shakespeare's reputation during the 18th century and the role of Garrick's Jubilee. In Stanley's own description, this was a process that required little more than the provision of a glass of sherry once a term and a little polite conversation. Whether in this style or not, uh, the work on the topic continued and expanded during Michael's fellowships and teaching stints in Harvard and other American universities, resulting in 1992 in the making of The National Poet, a publication which poised Michael as one of the young lions of Shakespeare's studies. This is a massively researched, elegant, mischievously incisive exploration of the rise of the British adulation of Shakespeare and of his canonization as a national poet. At its conclusion, one can already hear doors opening to future publications, to the inquiry into similar processes afoot in accents new and countries yet unknown to Shakespeare Beyond Britain, which has been an interest linking Michael's research across his career. After posts in both U USA and Britain, during one of which at Roehampton I met him for the first time, Michael was appointed director of the Shakespeare Institute in 2011. In the gossip naturally circulating around such moments, I remember a colleague observing that a man who has three women around him ought to be a very civilized boss. <laughs> she was, of course, referring to Nicola Watson, the person to whom the making of the national poet is dedicated, and to their twin daughters. It is hardly surprising, given this, that Michael was particularly attracted to Twelfth Night, 
uh, the story of lo uh, the loss and magical reunion of twins, and to Shakespearean comedy, uh, which offers a field day to its female characters. The marriage of true minds resulted in the co-authored England's Elizabeth, an afterlife in fame and fantasy, 2004, a book dealing with the fascination which the Virgin Queen still holds on this country. Other important work followed. The magisterial Oxford Companion to Shakespeare, co-edited with Stanley Wells, chapters of, on John Philip Campbell and Thomas Middleton for highly regarded academic publications. I would like to stress uh, Michael's interest in researching the uses of Shakespeare across Europe and his active work for the European Shakespeare Research Association, of whose board he was a member until recently. Michael's international standing is acknowledged not just by his publications, but also by two honorary doctorates from the universities of Craiova, Romania, in 2014, and Lund, Sweden, 2016. But however far afield Shakespeare takes him, he always returns to his roots, to Shakespeare in live performance, to the experience and role of actors. Two books testify to that. Performing Shakespeare's Tragedies Today, An Actor's Perspective, 2006, which was edited by Michael, and contains invaluable essays by actors on the nitty-gritty of performance. The other book, Shakespeare and Amateur Performance, A Cultural History, 2011, is a, an homage to the enthusiasm of non-professionals who have kept Shakespeare alive whatever the weather. Peter Holland describes it as an impressively learned and enjoyably witty study and as a game changer in the field of Shakespeare performance. Michael's connection with live performance was closely sustained during his long stint as a yearly reviewer for Shakespeare survey, where he has left an unforgettable record of professional performance. Though he complains that over the last six years his life has been taken up with admin, the time has been particularly productive both for him and the Institute, which has become a rare example of a gender-balanced institution. After the enormous work around the co-hosting of the World Shakespeare Congress in 2016, the Institute has also helped set up the Shakespeare Center China with Michael as co-director and has developed its own brand of single play editions, which are particularly amenable uh, for use by actors. It has also embarked on a formal collaboration with the Royal Shakespeare Company and has brought into its fold top theatre professionals like Greg Doran and Simon Russell Beale as honorary research fellows. No presentation of the Institute's director can be adequate without a reference, however cursory, to his musical talents. His aptly named band, Eddie Malone and the Footnotes, currently only of local renown, always gets the top billings at the Institute Christmas party, where year in, year out, they delight the crowds with covers of Janis Joplin or the Rolling Stones, but their truly unforgettable original number is entitled Bite My Leg written by Michael himself. Though some have described their music as loud, there have been no formal complaints from the neighbors, and the footnotes continue to be at the center of the Institute's play, uh, party life. It so happens that today's lecture comes a day after the centenary of the date when women were first given the vote, an event 
that has had, among other things, an effect on the performance and reception of Shakespearean comedy. To tell us about the recent fortunes of Love Labour's Lost and Much Ado About Nothing, I have the pleasure of inviting Professor Michael Dobson. Michael. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, you'll be relieved to hear the rest of the band couldn't make it this evening. Uh, and I don't think this PA is quite, um, quite up to size either. Um, that's a very generous and completely undeserved introduction, and it's always a great pleasure to work with Boyka, um, even when she is being uh, extremely flattering. Um, my thoughts this evening are primarily, of course, um, on the health of Professor Sir Stanley Wells, um, but I, I have been able to assure him, we are, we are in close touch, and I have been able to assure him that should he so require it, I will of course give a command, repeat performance of this lecture at his bedside uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, to be honest, given that Stanley was my doctoral supervisor, not having him in the front row in some ways is, is quite a relaxing uh, <laughs> state of affairs, though I understand that Peter Holland will be watching this uh, a recording of this, and Peter was, of course, the external examiner on my doctoral thesis, uh, and I assume he'll send me a full list of corrections in due course. Good. And um, then I begin. Yeah, let's, let's get these words out of the way of these nice people there. When does the action of Shakespeare's comedies happen, and when should it appear to be happening in performance? My interest in realism today is largely focused on these questions of time, always a pertinent matter around a playwright recognized even by contemporaries to be not of an age but for all time, and one so confident in his ability to deal with time dramatically that in The Winter's Tale he was even prepared to write dialogue for time himself. In what follows, I'm going to focus on two particular plays, Love's Labour's Lost and Much Ado About Nothing, partly because in 50 years of watching Shakespeare's comedies, these are the only two I have never seen staged in modern dress, and I'm curious as to why that should be the case. But I have two chief reasons for singling out Love's Labour's Lost and Much Ado About Nothing tonight, one of them site-specific and the other time-specific. The geographical one is that on this very block, this time last year, one could not only see Greg Doran of the Royal Shakespeare Company giving the Stanley Wells lecture in this room, but just up the road at the Haymarket, one could see a whole expeditionary force of his RSC colleagues performing Love's Labour's Lost and Much Ado About Nothing in an interlinked pair of productions by Christopher Luscombe, which I hope some of you saw and to which I'll be returning. The time-specific reason is that as fate would have it, I find myself here in London not only to give this lecture tonight, but tomorrow morning to attend the funeral of John Barton. John was one of the founders of the RSC, and while as a director he became perhaps most famous for his interpretations of the histories and the Roman plays, he also had an extraordinary gift with the comedies. And in the course of my argument this evening, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to pay tribute to his glorious productions of Much Ado About Nothing, 1976, and Love's Labour's Lost, which he directed twice, first in 1965 and then again in 1978. I'm going to start by stating the obvious as a convenient platform from which to move on over the rest of the talk to stating the even more obvious. First generalization then, Shakespeare's comedies are utterly unlike the scripts which succeeded them after the proscenium arch stage made realist sitcom the norm in anglophone comedy from the 1660s onwards. In the present day theatrical repertory, Shakespearean comedy belongs in a category of its own, and it may in performance require special handling of a kind unsuitable for comedies written more recently. It would be very surprising, for instance, if this picture of what remains Sally Jacobs' most famous stage design was surmounted by the words RSC in The Importance of Being Earnest. 
For all the paradox, whimsy, and irony of its script, Wilde's masterpiece, perhaps the most revised non-Shakespearean comedy in English, the most revived, assumes a stage which will offer a mechanical simulation of secular reality. Hence, this program, for its first performance, specifies that the play's action is to be realised on life-sized 3D representations of, for instance, the garden at the Manor House Woolton uh, and the morning room at the Manor House Woolton. Just as significantly and in just as unshakespearean a fashion, the program also specifies exactly when the play's action is to appear to be taking place. Time, the present. That is 1895. And the calendar at Wilton Hall hasn't either moved or been erased through all this play's many, many revivals ever since. But even if you can't obviously stage Wildean comedy on a stage made for Shakespeare, it appears that you can stage Shakespearean comedy on a stage made for Wilde. This, for instance, looks suspiciously like the morning room at the Manor House Woolton, and this looks like Gwendolyn and Cicely receiving a visit from a couple of random friends in the garden of the Manor House Woolton. After one of the final matinees of this show, I'd arranged to meet one of these performers at the stage door, just a little up Suffolk Street, so that in the background you can see what this building looks like when it doesn't have scaffolding all over it. And here she is. Uh, this is Lisa Dillon, or as those of us who knew her work before she turned professional and changed her name still think of her, Lisa Stawiarski. Like so many of the greats of the English theatre, she got her training on Brownsea Island in Poole Harbour. Here I was reminded that this show was even mounted on an authentically Wildean stage. The last of the three playhouses in which those large and expensive country house sets were assembled was the Theatre Royal in the Haymarket, where An Ideal Husband was premiered just before Ernest opened at the nearby St James's. But whatever the date of the architecture and the designs at the Haymarket, the script in which Lisa was appearing wasn't by Wilde, but by Shakespeare. Since here we were at Christopher Luscombe's interlinked RSC productions of Love's Labour's Lost and Much Ado About Nothing. These opened in Stratford in 2014, transferred thereafter to Chichester, and were last seen in London in spring 2017. Now, there are connections anyway between Wilde and Love's Labour's Lost. Most obviously, Wilde's borrowing of one of the play's motifs for the importance of being earnest when he has Jack arrive at Wilton Hall during the second act in full mourning so that we know that he has come to announce a death even before he speaks. This echoes the Princess of France's realisation at the end of her play that the similarly clad Mercade has come to give her the news of her father's death before he actually says so. But in Wilde, of course, not only is the play nowhere near over, but we know both that the dear departed, Jack's brother Ernest, is wholly fictitious, and that Algernon has beaten Jack to Woolton and has already been passing himself off as Ernest for much of the act so far. Luscombe's Love's Labour's Lost, though, was interested not in 1895, but in a date two decades later. Like several preceding directors of Love's Labour's Lost, notably Ian Judge and Trevor Nunn, Luscombe set his production very specifically in the summer of 1914. But like fewer directors of Much Ado, he set his at Christmas in 1918 double casting his leads across the two plays so that Benedict's post-war wooing of Beatrice seemed like the sequel to, to Barone's pre-war courtship of Rosaline. As the quotations on the poster and the production's long itinerary suggest, this was a very successful theatrical venture and it gave a great deal of pleasure to its audiences, not to mention gainful employment to a deserving team of carpenters, props buyers, costume makers, lighting technicians, assistant stage managers, and I should perhaps blush to confess, mercenary hack writers of program notes. Luscombe's productions, 
setting these plays in specific, recognizable time periods, which are neither Shakespeare's nor ours, belong to a category of Shakespearean revivals, which only became mainstream in the mid to late 20th century. In Shakespeare's own time, most plays seem to have been given in a sort of enhanced dressing up box version of contemporary clothing, and with the addition of a few recognizable historical markers here and there for specific kings, and the advent of smarter togas for Romans, and the survival of obsolete Elizabethan motley for fools, that remained the norm for costuming Shakespeare well down the 18th century. But then, to an abbreviate an argument made at more length elsewhere by, among others, Nicola Watson, Walter Scott and J.R. Planchet happened. Re and suddenly it was as if a law had been introduced recommending the death penalty for any actor manager found guilty of anachronism. In the 19th century, Shakespeare's histories and tragedies were to be performed strictly as if the action were taking place in the time of their characters, often on large sets representing specific castles at specific times. Among the comedies, A Midsummer Night's Dream, similarly, because set in and near Athens, demanded ancient Greek costumes and, preferably, massive sets depicting Athens, this one was designed by the Grieve brothers for Charles Keane's production of 1856. Apart from the similarly classical and hence tunic-clad comedy of errors, however, the other comedies were to be costumed as if taking place in Shakespeare's own lifetime, so in clothes more like this. This is Thomas Collins' as Slender uh, in Merry Wives. Objecting that modern audiences no longer knew how to read the conventions of Elizabethan dress, which for them carried all sorts of unhelpful connotations about Merry England and Morris dancing, and that anyway Shakespeare hadn't written his plays as fancy dress museum pieces and wasn't nearly keen on Morris dancing as some people made out, some directors, such as Barry Jackson, were already experimenting with a return to modern dress in the 1920s and 30s. A third way between Elizabethanism and modern dress, though, the practice of setting the plays at a recognisable point between Shakespeare's time and our own, has only caught on since the Second World War. It was pioneered, intriguingly, by two figures now more often cited as champions of the empty space and the open stage. In 1946, Peter Brook, hired by Barry Jackson when Brooke was still only 20, directed This Love's Labour's Lost in what was then the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre in Stratford. That's Paul Schofield as Don Armado, and the figure down in the front is a young Donald Sindon playing Dumaine. The clothes remained vaguely Elizabethan, but they hinted at Commedia dell'arte and the Harlequinade, so that combined with the Rococo details of the set and the rich yellows of the lighting, they seem to place the play's action in an 18th century fete galant from a Watteau painting. Tyrone Guthrie followed this lead to somewhere much nearer the present in 1953, when he directed All's Well That Ends Well in Stratford, Ontario, as if it were written by Shaw or Chekhov, an experiment he repeated in the other Stratford six years later. In their crinolines, veils and lorgnettes, Edith Evans, Zoe Caldwell, Angela Badley and the rest made the script of this sour Elizabethan fairy tale seem to be happening to a cast of Edwardians. These productions were very consciously taken as models by subsequent directors. In 1981, for instance, Trevor Nunn made what was in some important respects a remake of Guthrie's All's Well, this time with Peggy Ashcroft as the Countess and Harriet Walter as Helena. All three of these productions were described as autumnal, and they and their mode arguably partake of a general wistfulness about the past visible in English culture since the war, 
I should stress here that I myself have no objection on principle to this sort of one play on the elaborately realistic set of another approach to Shakespeare. Even though I'm nowadays very proud to be associated with flute theatre, whose low-budget minimalism can conjure the whole of Twelfth Night from a single guitar, and who can give you as much of Hamlet as you could possibly want, using only six actors, a sofa, a box of photographs, and the skull of a dog, I very much cherish the memory of Nuns All's Well. Indeed, I display a copy of the poster outside my office as an implicit warning to any students or indeed colleagues who may be tempted to speak of it with disrespect. It's important to recognize, though, as I shall show, that the use of non-modern but non-Elizabethan realistic period settings does very different things when imposed on different Shakespearean comedies. As with generalizing polemics in favor of either original practices or modern dress, there are always caveats and exceptions to be made. But there is a very familiar critique that is often made about any production in this realist period-specific mode, and I may as well outline it here before setting out to qualify it, particularly in connection with the stage histories of Love's Labour's Lost and Much Ado. Essentially, objectors to prosarch revivals of Shakespearean comedy in which the costumes and the designs all match so that they tie the play's action to a precise social milieu in a specific place at a single historical moment, tend to complain that such revivals impose post-Renaissance limits on Shakespeare's imagination. They drag his scripts into our own stunted and utilitarian industrialized world, it is said, in a manner complicit with one of received academic cultural history's favorite narratives of general decline. That narrative, most influ influentially outlined in Eric Auerbach's masterpiece, Mimesis, The Representation of Reality in Western Literature, 1946, is that of the fall into realism. Auerbach's chronological account of Western literature looks primarily at the long transition from epic to the novel, and it sees mainly a combination of disenchantment and downward mobility. In the beginning, classical poets and religious visionaries gave us the gods, and then epic heroes. Then their medieval successors gave us kings and knights errant, and then Cervantes happened, so that the chivalric romance dwindled into the realist novel, and the feudal Sir Lancelot was supplanted by the bourgeois Sir Charles Grandison. Auerbach only takes the story as far into the modern and as far down the social scale as Emma Bovary and Mrs. Ramsay, but you can see where it's going. Next stop, Leopold Bloom, and before you know where you are, elite literary fiction will be treating us to the misadventures of addicted Scottish dropouts in Welsh's train spotting. Auerbach has comparatively little to say about drama, starting appropriately with a medieval fall play, La Mystère d'Adam, and finishing with the fall of Schiller's middle-class heroine Louisa Miller. But he does touch on Shakespeare, who appears primarily as an anti-heroic colleague of Cervantes. The Shakespeare plays Auerbach singles out for discussion are accordingly, and perhaps misleadingly, Henry IV parts one and two free of supernatural characters, set at particular non-imaginary locations in Shakespeare's own homeland, and featuring the nearest the canon ever gets to specifying a year, when the king mentions, actually not quite accurately, that it is now 1,400 years since the crucifixion. For Auerbach, in short, Shakespeare is less the last of the ancients than the first of the moderns, and this view hasn't suited those for whom the whole point of the Shakespeare canon is that it gives us imaginative access to an unfallen, still numinous, handcrafted world in which pictures of Troy still looked much like pictures of Camelot and for which history hadn't yet dwindled to a series of date-stamped landmarks in what Benedict Anderson would call the universal, empty, secular time of modern nationalism. For those invested in Shakespeare as a non-realist, 
The 1590s are liable to be remembered not as the crucible of historical drama documentary, but as a time when theatre audiences were still prepared to believe in ghosts and witches and fairies, and when theatre architects hadn't been distracted by fancy lighting and perspective scenery into forgetting that the space under the actors' feet was hell and the space above their heads was heaven. The most important early proponent of this view was Wilde's contemporary William Pole of the English Stage Society, who thought that in order to stage Shakespeare's plays properly, we needed to abandon all the machinery of realism and get back to something approximating to the conditions and practices of the Elizabethan Playhouse. This photograph depicts Pole's production of Measure for Measure at the Royalty Theatre in 1893. As you can see, instead of commissioning a fussy, elaborate antiquarian set, complete with matching costumes, all distractingly and irrelevantly obsessed with a particular time period, Pole commissioned a fussy, expensive, elaborate set, <laughs> complete with matching costumes, all distractingly and irrelevantly obsessed with a particular time period. The central problem of living in an era that has a different sense of historicity than did Shakespeare's is not so much solved here as slightly and anxiously relocated. The once upon a time of the play has not only become once upon a time that was definitely 1604, but has become once upon a time that was definitely 1604 and as if it's still being acted in 1604. The anachronistic taboo against anachronism, which Pohl merely extended from costumes to staging, has, if anything, been extended still further by some of his latter-day disciples in places like Stanton, Virginia, and indeed Southwark, for whom antiquarian pseudo-Elizabethan stage sets have simply expanded to become entire antiquarian pseudo-Elizabethan theatres, which for some of the plays and with some directors and performers work very well, I hasten to add, even given that it is so far proved technically impossible to supply genuine Elizabethan playgoers to fill the pastiche Elizabethan benches. But for some of, this play, some of the plays, their approach has definitely been counterproductive, as I hope to show. First, though, how well does the view of Shakespearean comedy as irreconcilable with the illusionist stage actually fit either the canon of Shakespearean comedy or our dominant account of the illusionist stage? Among these plays, certainly, A Midsummer Night's Dream isn't exactly bourgeois realism in embryo, and hence in part Peter Brook's decision to park a white box of circus tricks in front of the stage space, which might otherwise have simulated a real palace and a real forest, and nor is The Tempest. But in fact, despite Brook, these are two of the plays which over time the proscenium arch has liked best, and we forget at our peril that even if in the 19th century perspective sets and illusionist scenery came to be associated with middle-class realism, they were invented to bring us the gods. The specimens of proscenium arch theatre which Shakespeare himself had the chance to hear of or see dealt not in minute present-day social observation but in divine spectacle. The first perspective auditorium built in England for spoken drama rather than for a court mask was this one, designed by Inigo Jones and others when James I and his court visited the Hall of Christ Church, Oxford in 1605. Uh, that's the stage where it says I uh, over on the left. Uh, the king sits where it says K so that he gets the best view. Uh, and these are raised benches. Uh, the two things labelled B are stair towers, um, you know, just in case you're going to try and build this at home later. Uh, and uh, there it is from the side. As you can see from the little drawing and the dotted line that runs down from H to the stage, this was a proper theatre with sight lines. You know, it's, uh, you know, though, even though you only got 18 inches of leg room uh, if you were seated at the back. The figures who came down this temporary structure's pioneering raked acting area uh, 
in between large triangular scenery pieces, which could be turned in mid-performance to change locations, were mainly nymphs, satyrs, shepherds, and Olympians, in Latin plays including Alba and Vertumnus, and in Samuel Daniel's Arcadia Reformed, later retitled The Queen's Arcadia. Uh, and I should say that a performance of this latter play will be given in that very hall at Christchurch by a team from Shakespeare's Globe on September the 15th, uh, complete with a lecture by Dr. Elizabeth Sandis of the Shakespeare Institute. Uh, please book now uh, to avoid disappointment. If any of Shakespeare's comedies look disappointingly short on gods and fairies, it may be because they're too far from the proscenium arch mode as he understood it, rather than too near it. And so far from being the scenes which the proscenium arch couldn't cope with, it was Shakespeare's representations of the supernatural which the new indoor theatres of the later 17th century found most congenial. Uh, turning in particular Midsummer Night's Dream and The Tempest into spectacular semi-operas. Uh, on the left, that's the frontispiece to Nicholas Rowe's edition of The Tempest, 1709, though it shows the play as it was being staged in a theatre that Rowe knew rather than any theatre that Shakespeare had known. And on the right, that's, of course, uh, the title page of the Purcell semi-opera based on Dream, Fairy Queen, uh, which, is, you know, which off the stage of the English National Opera just over there has shown. The subsequent rise of ballet only made it more possible to stage fairies rather than less, and this lovely piece of scenery and choreography, again from Charles Keane's 1856 Dream, could easily have been recycled in other non-Shakespearean shows of the time, especially at Christmas. To this day, British proscenium arch theatres earn much of their annual income from showing their audiences fairies, ghosts, which are behind you, and spectacular transformations in pantomimes. Shows which, as I've argued elsewhere, descend in part from the early 18th century's annual revivals of that restoration version of The Tempest over the festive season. Oh, yes, they do. Uh, Tinkerbell always was a version of Ariel, and whether Tinkerbell and Ariel or Puck are staged on a mock Tudor open platform in the same light as the audience, or in a darkened red plush theatre royal, if you don't believe in fairies, boys and girls, they will all die. Good. Right, as, now we've established that point, um, I'll move on towards uh, Much Ado. The problems and opportunities posed for modern stage interpreters, even by the conveniently fairy-free Much Ado and Love's Labour's Lost, it seems to me, don't arise because they are non-realist sorts of play that nowadays get performed on anachronistically realist stages. I'm going to deal with the, these two plays in folio order because I think that approaches which often only compound the problems encountered in modern revivals of Much Ado, even though it's much the more popular and often staged of these two, can provide ideal solutions for Love's Labour's Lost. I hope a quick survey of some characteristic designs for Much Ado, especially around the question of when its action is supposed to be taking place, will make the first part of this point for me. David Garrick would be one of the last actors ever to play Benedict in modern dress. Benedict and his reluctant challenge to Claudio made plenty of sense in the mid-1700s, a time when a gentleman's everyday outfit might still include a sword as a matter of course. Over the ensuing century, though, things changed. By the time of William Charles Macready, Renaissance comedies demanded Renaissance mise-en-scene, and like it or not, and I don't think he did, Macready's Benedict had to wear those tights. However painful, uh, this engraving definitely makes them look. <laughs> if we jump ahead more than a century uh, to 1976, though, the problem which these costumes are trying to solve is a different one entirely. As a tightly constructed, secular, realistic-looking play about a well-nigh arranged marriage which takes place in a culture for which premarital sex can be a killing matter, 
Much Ado was still, in Garrick's time, painfully applicable. You could imagine people dressed like members of Garrick's audience sharing the attitudes expressed by Claudio and Leonardo, which meant that you didn't need to set the play either long ago or far away or both. But from the mid-20th century onwards, the play was liable to become not just costume drama, but safe costume drama, the story of problems which are no longer ours. John Barton's brilliant production, remembered above all for Judy Dench's combination of verve and pathos, and for Donald Sindon's at once suave, crusty, and at times frenetically paranoid Benedict, sold this in part by setting the play among young subalterns and their older colleagues in the British Raj. Here one could believe in the hero plot, while not quite feeling exempt from it. In 1976, this empire setting seemed historically distant, but uncomfortably not distant enough. Reverting to the MacReady tactic of setting the play in some approximation of Shakespeare's own period by contrast has tended to produce much cosier results. As for the RSC in 1996 uh, and for the National in 2007, uh, and it's, uh, you'll notice in the middle of the, this bottom picture, that's a picture of Simon Russell Beale dancing. You know, you know, cherish that. You know, it's, uh, the surprise which John Barton had achieved with his 19th century colonial setting, furthermore, had largely worn off by the time Cheek by Jowl simply recycled it in 1998, uh, by which time the jewel in the crown had uh, made such costumes the stuff of middle-brow television. Greg Doran's return to the play's specified location of Sicily in 2002, albeit the fascist Sicily of the 1930s, again produced an effect of the familiar and safely picturesque, rather than the urgently to do with us. In 2005, Josie O'Rourke yet again set the play among 19th century officers. And the following year, Marianne Elliott, presumably in what was by now a positively desperate search for a setting which would really hit a local contemporary nerve for her Stratford audiences, placed hers in pre-revolutionary Cuba. It was actually more like it was set in Strictly Come Dancing. Uh, but, um, you know, it had its charms. Um, in the Tams in Greg can dance. The nearest any recent British stage production has come to giving us a modern dress much ado was O'Rourke's second production in London in 2011. And that one was marked as not being a specimen of anxious present-day realism by being placed very specifically in a lost archaeological era of undiluted kitsch when dinosaurs stalked the earth and from which nothing that survives could possibly be taken seriously, namely the early 1980s. <laughs> to see why stage directors haven't given us a much ado in modern dress, I think you have only to look as briefly as possible at Joss Whedon's 2012 film, um, which I personally find borderline unintelligible, uh, and which has always just left me wondering who and where are all these awful, indistinguishable people who make their staff wear uniforms and can somehow spend all day drinking wine in each other's houses? And why do they go on about marriage but never mention divorce? And what is this problem they have around Hero? It's true that when the RSC staged the play in the same year, they didn't go for very long ago either, but they did go for quite far away. Iqbal Khan's production placed the action in a best exotic marigold modern India of incompetent family servants and honour killings. But in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Warwickshire, this remained a play about other people's problems, not those of its audience. For all the plot's violence, Luscombe's 1918 country house setting just brought things comfortably home to Downton Abbey. Amelia, in which we can still expect there to be livery servants and can still believe that the virginity of an heiress might be something over which gentlemen might fight to the death. The recurrent problem with Much Ado is that most of 
what once made its contents dangerous and serious and worth laughing about now looks like just one more aspect of its harmless period charm. Staging it on a big pros arch set that simulates the social world of 1598 instead of that of 1918 or whenever just chooses one mode of period charm over another. And for my money, putting on much ado in an entire playhouse that simulates a few of the playing conditions of 1598 into the bargain helps even less. I say this with feeling, having seen not one but two productions of Much Ado About Nothing double cast with Love's Labour's Lost in 2017, the second at the replica Blackfriars Playhouse in Virginia. I've never seen a Much Ado during which I've been so conscious and so sorry that this is a Shakespeare play whose script actually includes the words, hey nonny nonny. <laughs> this show was this show was folksy, it was big, it was the cutest Renaissance fair with a Y in town. It was one long ye olde doublet and hose punchline. And whatever this production thought the play's problem was, I was very glad it wasn't mine. Um, incidentally, next time someone tries to tell you that small theatres produce intimate, nuanced acting, you know, just mention this production. <laughs> And yet somehow, the love's labour's lost. Same actors, same space, same absence of set, many of the same outfits, was lovely. The same fake Tudor mise-en-scene that made Much Ado look irrelevant somehow only made love's labour's lost more entrancing and more telling. If anything resembling nostalgia only sabotages Much Ado about nothing, Love's Labour's Lost, in my experience, is instead thoroughly hospitable to it. And I want to conclude this evening by suggesting why it should be that time behaves quite differently, not just in but around performances of Love's Labour's Lost. I admit that I'm perhaps still biased in favour of this particular play by having seen an exceptional production of it at an impressionable age, but bear with me. John Barton first directed Love's Labour's Lost for the RSC in 1965 in a production which sought to look as Elizabethan as possible. He dressed the men like figures from exquisite Hilliard miniatures, but had some difficulty in persuading the women, who included Glenda Jackson, to adopt authentically Elizabethan hairstyles, which didn't suit the aesthetics of 1965 anything like as well. In the rehearsal photo, that's Charles Thomas, who played Barone, and Janet Suzman, who was Rosaline. In 1978, Barton got the chance to direct the play again. Ralph Coltai's set, bearing in mind all that I've said already, ought to have misfired completely. A realistically faked up corner of an Elizabethan park in a pros arch theatre with real boughs and leaves. How naff. And surely the costumes ought to have been a write-off of cliches as well. Here are a sample. As you can see, it's the usual Tudor look, tastefully adapted to suggest monastic academic seclusion, autumn weather, and good color coordination. The overall effect ought to have been somewhere on the edge of not another merry English bit of sadness but it wasn't, and in fact, if you do want me to cry remembering how good this production was, nothing could be easier. I queued for a student standby for one of the matinees at the Aldwych, and 30 years later, I finally got to thank John Barton for it in detail during his 80th birthday party. I remember him saying that much as he had enjoyed working with the 1965 cast, despite that incident during the costume rehearsal, this 1978 production was, of all the RSC shows he had ever directed, the one for which he got the highest proportion of the actors he had wanted. Here are Richard Griffiths as the King of Navarre, Michael Pennington as Barone, and Ian Charlson as Longueville, three men who could move weightlessly across a stage as if propelled by the grace of the verse alone, and offstage were the likes of Michael Horden as Don Armado, David Suchet as Nathaniel, and Alan Rickman as Boyer. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, the women included Jane Lapater as Rosaline, Carmen du Sautai as the princess, Sheridan Fitzgerald as Maria, and of all people, Ruby Wax. And I'm not dreaming this, honestly. <laughs> Ruby Wax as an entirely convincing and actually rather touching Jack Winetta. So how come an Elizabethan look much ado is usually at best efficient while an Elizabethanizing Love's Labour's Lost can be definitely sublime. I think we have to go back to the origins of this play to work out why. If Much Ado is a play which has only accidentally turned into a historical document of other times, Love's Labour's Lost is a play which deliberately sought to transform the historic into the nostalgic from its outset, a play which indeed thematizes that process. While Much Ado used to be topical, but ceased to be by sheer historical accident, uh, when written, Love's Labour's Lost flirted deliberately and riskily with topicality, but opted deliberately for the mythic, determined not just to dance to the music of time, but to show that it wasn't confined to anything currently in the charts. There is an immense critical literature on the historical events alluded to in this play, on why Shakespeare touches on them at all, and on what effect, if any, this has had on the play's reception. Much of it has been written by obsessives and conspiracy theorists, and I'm very happy that by now I only have about three minutes in which to summarize the entire matter. In brief, once upon a time, there really was a King of Navarre, and there really were some courtiers called Barone, Longueville, and Dumain, and the king really was interested in humanist learning. And this king of Navarre actually did marry a princess of France. This ought to have constituted a happier ending than the suspended proposal with which we're left at the end of the play. But unfortunately, immediately after the real life wedding, many of the guests who had sat on the groom's side, together with hundreds of their allies, were killed in the streets of Paris. This, then, is the scene which various incidental details of Love's Labour's Lost ought to be asking us to imagine, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, a key event in the pan-European wars of religion of Shakespeare's time. The plot premise of Love's Labour's Lost ought at very least to have reminded those of its audience up to speed with French politics of the real-life embassy to the King of Navarre made by his estranged wife and mother-in-law in 1578 to discuss the future of Aquitaine. And the fact that the King of Navarre in the play breaks an oath would surely have reminded many more that the real-life King of Navarre, by now Henry IV of France, had in 1593 broken a rather more serious oath when he renounced his Protestantism in order to secure his power on the grounds, famously, that Paris was worth a mass, which incidentally it is. The play with which to double cast this one really ought not to be much ado about nothing at all, but a play by Shakespeare's closest contemporary, Christopher Marlowe, The Massacre at Paris. It might be rather piquant to see the same Dumaine writing love poetry one night and the next suggesting that he should take some archers to the bridges over the Seine and finish off those Protestants already driven into the river. But it would also miraculously be irrelevant because this entire aspect of Love's Labour's Lost turns out to be a sort of poignant tease. Marlowe's play definitely happens in France in 1572. Love's Labour's Lost happens in a France that never quite was, in a year that never quite was. The courtly, leisured interlude the play asks us to imagine isn't just a happy peacetime before a real massacre, and nor does the play work solely because it imagines a France in which there seems to be only the scholarship and poetry of the Renaissance and none of the discord and bloodshed of the Reformation. Its historical allusions serve instead deliberately to remind us of realities outside the play, which we too are for the time being escaping into its sonnets and charades. We already know this idyll is inauthentic and fragile even before the news of the offstage death of the princess's father reminds us that soon the play will be over 
and we will have to go back to being mortal and ourselves. The world depicted in Love's Labour's Lost may contain pedants and constables rather than satyrs, but it's recognisable as a province of Greek myth just the same, Arcadia restored. It's entire non-plot, a replaying of that other fall myth by which death intrudes into Arcadia, consciously superimposed on a real merely historical but outside the play world of cruelty and discord. As the modern performance history of Love's Labour's Lost demonstrates furthermore, in place of a Renaissance France found only in the play's parallel and better universe, other cliched shorthands for lost idols will do very nicely. The connotations which bedevil much ado only assist this play. Whether those evoked by the familiar uh, default setting mock Tudor woodwork of the globe in Dominic Drongul's excellent production of 2007, and you've no idea how difficult it is for me to say Dominic Drongul's excellent production, how much it hurts. Um, you know, there's Michel Terry, incidentally, you know, possibly firing at him, uh, but, but we don't know. Uh, or the onstage, more realistic oaks of Greg Doran's production of 2008. Or indeed, the eve of war, Zuleika Dobson, Oxford, offered by Ian Judge's designs in 1993. Or, to return to where we started, to that summer 1914 importance of thinking you're being earnest country house favoured by Christopher Luscombe. Time is an urgent matter in Much Ado, but with its passage, that play's very realism has become its curse, helping history to get the better of it. Love's Labour's Lost was all about trying to sidestep history from the start, and it turns out that there are still any number of ways, realist or not, in which the Shakespearean theatre can take us briefly to Arcadia, some of them even using a proscenium arch. The sad nostalgic truth, though, is that we still don't get to stay there, and so I close on a note of sheer realism. He may be dressed like Jack Worthing or like Hamlet. He may belong to 1914 or to 1572 or even to 1978. But at the end of Act 5, Mercade will still be coming for us. Uh, I'm told that before I get a drink, I have to take questions, uh, which, of course, I'm very happy to do, however thirstily. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. The series of plays which um, Boyka mentioned, these new performance-friendly editions uh, that are being produced by the Shakespeare Institute with the Shakespeare Institute logo on them, co-edited by Simon Russell Beale, are called the Arden Performance Editions of Shakespeare. It's funny you should mention that. And uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, that's true. They are available already <laughs> in all good bookshops. Thank you. Mm. Yes. Um, Oh, what a pity. It's, it sounds like exactly the production that would have prevented me writing this entire lecture. <laughs> Was it good? How shocking. There'll be, there'll be people playing Danish princes who don't speak Danish next. <laughs> No, 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 Bridget's got a question. Look, look. Um, I'm, thank you. I'm, oh, thank you. The play was fantastic. Um, I was, I'm really interested in those two Carolinian much ados um, that, that the RSC did. Um, one was, I think, Jacobin. Yeah, yeah, Sinead Cusack. Um, yeah, yeah. With real sort of uber prestige. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Men yeah. costumes on that kind of glowing set. Yes. And then, um, was it Green the Danish bitches? A, a bit Roger of, Allen yes, puffing a cigar behind much, a bush. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Much more realist, Carolyn. Yes, costumes. yes. Much more outdoors. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and 
I guess my question is, how does that work? How does the difference mm -hmm. between pastiche theory costume yeah. and something that is signalling exactly yes. however accurate it may yes. be? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very important distinction, the one between, you know, pretend you're, you're not really in a theatre, but you're using some kind of magic equipment to spy on a theatre a long time ago, or look, here are some modern actors in really nice fancy dress. Um, and that can change from second to second within one production. You know, I mean, you, you've only got to give a sarcastic look or a particular inflection or, you know, look, look incredulously at your own ruff, uh, uh, and, and the effect becomes uh, totally different. Um, I think, nonetheless, with Much Ado, those fancy productions just were, it was all about distancing it. Um, it made the it made the play about even less. It made the sort of you know sort of slightly about itself. I mean, it seemed to be based much more on the idea that well, people in the audience will have seen the Laughing Cavalier, and therefore will recognise this as kind of mm, comedy, you know, sort of vaguely Dutchness uh, or, or or whatever it is. Um, but it's certainly, I mean, for me at least, it's certainly a way of, of producing a very familiar kind of entertainment that doesn't actually really allow you to think much about what the play's actually about. I thought it was a Nick. brilliant reading of The Massacre of Paris, Massacre of Paris and the mm. Bud's Day was lost, but is there not a slight journey to be taken towards the Sicilian Vespers mm -hmm. and the Spanish occupation of Sicily? Yeah, 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 and who, which, which Don John it is, and and, and so well, forth. Well, that doesn't bother me, but yeah. it seems to me that it's a, it's a, uh, it's a culture under political stress. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. No, I th I think that'll work. But how you sell that to an audience who are going to buy tickets for the stalls in Stratford, <laughs> I'm not quite sure unless you give them a really long program note, which they'd have to pay extra for. But that's why yeah. the Barton 76 yeah. production was so good. Yes. It, it was an, an yeah, it was an analogy. Was exactly, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Sellers, uh, yes. Sellers. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it was, one, it was one thing I liked about Luscombe's. I liked having a shell-shocked dogberry. I thought that worked really nicely. Michael, thank you very much for mm, the presentation. My curiosity is whether your paper will be available for wider consumption. Um, no, I don't think so. I believe they've I believe they've recorded it, and you know, if bootleg copies circulate on the dark web, that that's you know, that's the kind of thing that happens. You know. yeah. Yes, um, but so I don't have any plans. No. Any Sorry. I'm free to quote you then in any way oh, I might recall. by all means. Yeah. By all means. Thank you. Yes. Yes, it will be on the next website. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And if you want to refresh your memory of the text I'm talking about, one of the first plays to have come out in the Arden Performance Editions of Shakespeare series is indeed much ado about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. It's terrible when they mic theatres up. You never know where, any, where, where who's, who's speaking. Yes? So I'm a student um, in Professor Bungalow's class, and we're seeing much ado about nothing next Wednesday. Oh. And I was wondering if you'd seen that production and what you thought of it. Um, send me a paper title and I'll write it later. You know, I, I haven't, no. No, you'll have to see what you yourself make of it first. <laughs> have you seen a production of much ado that you like? Yeah. Oh yeah, loads. I like all of them actually. I just think some of them are just very safe and sitcommy and and don't do all that much for me. And uh, and some of them do. I quite liked Eve Best's Beatrice at the Globe a little while ago. That was good. I mean, I quite enjoyed Roger Allen's Cigar. You were still allowed to be able to smell the smoke in those days. You know, even from the back of the stalls in the RST, it was quite a good cigar. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's, I, I suppose I'm being masochistic. I think the play ought to be a bit traumatic, as well as very polished and very slick and very well-constructed and very light. And I have a slight problem with its plot, which is that 
I don't think the Margaret Margaret's participation in the subplot makes any sense <laughs> in the time scheme into which Shakespeare has squeezed the action. Um, you know, she ought to. She there are points at which she ought to know things that her lines suggest she doesn't, uh, and so on. Um, yeah. But yes, I think that's probably the answer. Thanks. Oh, look, it's Pete Smith. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little, a little bit about the, uh, the sort of rebranding of the RSC's production when it came to, they were bookended as Last Labour's yes. more than one. And then yes. of course, when they came down, was that simply because no one outside Stratford I mean, I don't no know one in Stratford. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, was this simple, simple marketing? Or it was. Ending, or I think. Was I think it was a very foolish decision to call them Love's Labour's Lost and Love's Labour's Won, given that people always buy tickets for Much Ado About Nothing, and they never buy tickets for Love's Labour's Won because they've never heard of it. And if they have heard of it, they know it's Shakespeare's missing play, which was out in quarto, but which sadly we don't have. Um, so yeah, and, and I think they'd learned that lesson from the infuriated people working in their Stratford box office by the time the show's moved anywhere else. And I think it's as simple as that. 